Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, I'm really glad that we started with something that was so uplifting and that showed the contrast of the dark and the light. I'll be honest in that I am not Mary Sunshine with my message today. Um, but I think it's really important that we have facts behind us and that we understand the base from which we're building upon to make the changes in our community that we all seek. Um, what I would share with you is that without significant collaboration between the social service sector and the private sector, Iowa communities will continue to face growing unemployment and particularly underemployment rates and increased poverty rates. That may sound startling, you say, how can you say that? Um, and I'll show you where this comes from. But what has happened over the last you know, couple of decades, but particularly the last decade in Iowa, is that despite having very modest standards of living, you know, compared to other communities and other states around the nation, individuals working are not able to keep up with the rising cost of living expenses. And that's really what we're finding. There is the fact that if we don't do something to really increase the education and training opportunities for individuals at the lower end of the wage spectrum, our communities will have increased poverty rates. We'll continue to see growing rates of un and underemployment. And there's really a loss. There's a loss in our community of economic vitality. There's a loss of human capital. And there's a loss of opportunities for the residents of our community. So I want to talk with you about where we're at so that we can make informed choices going forward. And I practiced this. OK, I've got the. <laughs> so um, what we've done is we've constructed cost of living budgets. We've been doing this for a while. I'm not going to give you the history, but I want to tell you what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. We felt it was very important to have a clear sense of what it costs for individuals, whether that's an individual person, a married person, a single person, what it costs for households in Iowa to make ends meet. We wanted to develop a survival budget. What does it take to get by? So we used a few budget assumptions. One, we wanted to make sure that they had everything that they needed to be able to work full time. So you'll see that reflected here. We included child care um, for individuals who didn't have a parent staying home with a child. Um, we included very basic um, clothing and household expenses, a telephone, clothing, um, very uh, minimal level of expenditures. Food, we assumed that all food is cooked and eaten at home using the USDA low cost food plan. So there's no eating out, everything is prepared right at home. Healthcare, we wanted to make sure that people had healthcare coverage, so we split the costs down to the county level between what people pay out of pocket um, for their portion of employer-sponsored care, or if they're uninsured, to buy it on the private market. Um, housing, we wanted to make sure everyone had a home. So we've included rent at the 40th percentile of HUD market rates. We didn't say we're gonna go top of the line, we don't want anything substandard. So just a bit below what would be um, the average, so 40% of HUD market rates. And transportation, people need to be able to get to work. Because Iowa lacks a, uh, an extensive public transportation system, uh, we really worked on the assumption that people needed a vehicle to get to and from work. Um, we also know that everyone pays taxes. We've got um, state taxes, income, and payroll taxes included. And so we did this and we calculated a very basic survival budget for 98%, I'm sorry, 89% of Iowa households. We have 21 family types represented. I'm not gonna glaze your eyes with that and I only have 15 minutes. So we pulled up a couple to give you an example. So at that very basic threshold, we determined that a single parent with one child um, working full time would need to earn $18.08 an hour in order to meet that very basic threshold. If they were to have a second child, that would actually jump up to $24.88. So almost $25 an hour. And this is in your community. This is in the Cedar Rapids metropolitan statistical area. Um, did I do something? <laughs> If we had a different family type, we looked at married couples. If uh, one adult was working and one was able to stay home with the child, thus reducing the childcare expense, still that individual um, parent would need to earn $19.56 an hour. If both parents are working with two children, um, they each would need to earn $14.49 an hour. So these are much higher wages than when we start thinking about the minimum wage or even the median wage. If you looked at the median wage in this community, um, which is around 16, it's $15 in the state, but it's 16 in Cedar Rapids, $16. So yeah, <laughs> about $16 an hour. 
um, this is reflecting that you're going to need at least two workers in the household in order to meet those basic living expenses. And before we go on from these numbers, I'd just like to point out that there are some things that we know that would be in a, in a thriving budget that we've completely omitted. You'll see there's nothing included for if you have an emergency. If your car breaks down, if you're sick, if you don't have paid leave and you're unable to work, there's no cushion for you. There are no savings for training, whether that's your professional development or your children's training down the road. There are no savings for retirement. There's nothing included here for birthday gifts or Christmas gifts. There's nothing included for recreation, and there is absolutely nothing included for debt, which we know is a reality for many Iowa households. So at this very, very basic level, we're talking about these family types are needing to earn between $15 and $24 an hour to survive. That is not the history of Iowa, and that is not the assumption that many people are working upon. So what this means is that we have to look very critically and very intentionally about the kinds of wages that are in our community and how we help people secure those kinds of wages. Um, I did want to let you know, because I know that there are others in the room who work outside of Lynn County, um, this information is available for a variety of family types, not the four that I just mentioned, and it's available for all 99 counties. So you can go to the Iowa Policy Project website, you can click on this map, you can click on your county, and um, up will pop information. So we have that for, for everyone. The other thing that I think is important to share is that, and we've talked about it in an, in an hourly wage, you know, that $18.08 an hour, um, it's good to look at it in an annual sum as well. So if we look at the annual salary, we determined that a family supporting wage, again, it's that survival budget, is really for a single adult around $20,000 a year. For a single parent with one child, it's $32,000 a year, and you can see as it goes down. What we noticed is that when you compare that with the federal poverty guideline, because that's the discussion that a lot of people have, and we're talking about what are the needs of our community, it's all based around what, it, what are our poverty rates. This is how we determine who is in need in our community. And what we've discovered is looking at specific Iowa spending down to the county level, the federal poverty guideline really underestimates what our families need to live and work in our communities. Um, in each of these instances, uh, families are needing to earn actually about 200% more or, or twice, 200% of the federal poverty guideline or twice what the federal poverty guideline is. Um, you can see for a single parent with two children, the federal poverty guideline is $18,530. And we've determined that actually they need to earn over 42000 at that very basic threshold, everything that I talked to you about, what they would be able to bring home. Um, there is a significant disconnect between what gets described as um, the needs of our community using that standard and what families actually have to earn. And I'll just say briefly, because sometimes folks have a real question about how, how could that be and how does that happen, I'll just throw out there that the Federal Poverty Guideline was established um, almost 50 years ago. <laughs> um, and the methodology since that time has not been updated. It was based on um, taking the largest expenditure for families, which was food at the time, it was one-third of their, of their expenses, multiplying that times three, and that was the threshold. Today, families spend only a sixth to a seventh of their budget on uh, food. So there is a growing disconnection. The federal poverty guideline also assumed that women were not a formalized part of the workforce, so they omitted child care. Um, they also have one housing cost, whether you live in Iowa, Minnesota, Mississippi, California. There isn't that geographical variation when we know there's a difference between living in Hiawatha and Cedar Rapids um, and Lone Tree. There's variance that way. And the third area where, which creates this growing disconnection is transportation. Our transportation costs have gone up dramatically since the mid-1960s. Um, people live farther away from work to get to and from work just cost much more. So as long as childcare, housing, and transportation um, are a significant factor for families, and I would say that they're actually the largest, I'm gonna do it this way, sorry, you know the crunching, um, are the largest portions of a family's budget. You can see that childcare, housing, and transportation are. There's gonna be a growing disconnection between the federal poverty rate and what families actually need to live and work. So it's an important um, bit of information to hold in mind 
when you're looking at statistics, when you're trying to describe what your community's needs are, and when you're trying to determine who needs the assistance. Um, to go a step further, uh, and we've added this because we've been pressed, which is good, we've been pressed by legislators when we share this information, they would say, yeah, we have an idea that Iowa's wages aren't keeping up. We, we understand that the, the model of family says that they need these higher wages, but when it really comes to Iowans, how many people are struggling? We need to know, we need you to look at Iowa households and say how many are falling below that line. And we can say that for the first time, and this is where it is stark um, and needs some specific um, responses and creativity. Uh, there's also tremendous opportunity for these households. But um, we've learned that 23% of Iowa households who are working, this omits um, elderly households, and it omits households that have someone who's working less than half time. So, so a household who has at least someone working half time or more, 23% of those households in the state of Iowa are working and not earning enough to get at that very basic level of survival or financial subsistence. Um, when you look at groups, you'll see very quickly some groups are doing better than others. Even amongst the group that's performing the best, married couples without children, it's 12%. That means one out, more than one out of 10 married couples without children are working and are not earning enough to meet their basic needs. When you look at single parents, it's a dramatically different story. Again, because I've sort of communicated, our wages actually require that you're gonna need to have two adults to meet our living expenses now. Living expenses have gone up, even in Iowa. Um, single parents, three out of four single parent households are working and not earning enough to get by. Lynn County is doing a little bit better. Um, the overall uh, number of households who are struggling in Lynn County is 18.7%. So just about one in five households in Lynn County are working and not earning enough to get by. I'm sure most people in the room don't feel that that's an adequate number, even though it's better than the state average. Um, however, there is an opportunity to do something about that. I have to move very quickly, and I just wanted to reflect just a quick picture of another way to understand the financial realities that, that families are facing. This assumes a single parent is working with two children in Cedar Rapids at $9 an hour. And what we've discovered is you line up that, those $9 an hour for year-round employment uh, against all the expenses that we outlined, and the person is short <laughs> over $17,000 a year working at $9 an hour. There is something that can be done. We can work collectively to fill in the gap between low wages and what it costs to live in our communities. And one of the ways we do that in the state of Iowa is through a variety of work support programs that would address some of those things, childcare assistance, food assistance, public health insurance, um, the state and federal earned income tax credit, but ways that we can help um, folks at that low level get by. And with all of those programs together, they actually have over $4,000 in excess at the end of the year to be able to use for what their needs are. Um, the only difficulty in that, and this is the big picture, that's relying only on public supports, and there are other supports that can come into play, and that's something that we'll be talking about with our next speaker, is that relying only on the public supports that exist for Iowans, you'll see that they do okay at that low wage level with the public work supports up until around $12 an hour. And they hit a significant cliff when they, when they lose child care assistance. Um, the most important thing for us to recognize is that they don't break even again until they reach $18 an hour. And they don't get back to where they were before they lost that, that child care assistance and those public supports until $20 an hour. So the question for us is, if that's the economic reality, if people are working, if they are doing their part, if they are not earning enough to meet their late basic living expenses, if the public supports that we have in place don't fill in that gap, how do people get from $12 an hour to $18 an hour? How do they get from $12 to $20 an hour? And I believe, and many of us in this room believe, that education and skilled uh, workforce development is the way that they make that leap. With every successive year, uh, level of education attained, unemployment rates go down, um, wages go up, um, we know that individuals who earn more with each successive level of education um, until you reach a doctoral degree, which at that point we're not going to be particularly concerned, you're doing okay. Um, an individual with some college but no degree earns 
$268 more per week, or that's $14,000 a year, than someone who has less than a high school diploma. Dee mentioned that high school education isn't enough for the needs of business today. It's also clearly not enough for Iowans to support themselves. That's very evident. Unemployment and underemployment rates of those without a high school diploma are more than double of those with an associate's degree. So matter whether we, it doesn't matter whether we look at unemployment or we look at wages, we look at poverty, um, it's undeniable that education pays for Iowans. And this holds true even in hard times, as better educated workers are less likely to fall into poverty when they hit economic difficulties, like the recession we just um, have been recovering from, and because they spend less time without work um, after a job loss and are more likely to be reemployed at comparable wages. In addition to it having a benefit for individuals, um, earnings rise, unemployment goes down, underemployment goes down, people living in poverty goes down, it's also a tremendous benefit for our broader communities. Um, with higher levels of educational attainment among your community's workforce, your local businesses have better trained workers, there's more income in the community to be spent, and there are lower levels of poverty within the broader community. We've also done some research that shows that um, investments in education benefit the state budget, that because obtaining higher education actually allows workers to work more hours, to um, have higher wages, they're able to earn more overall and they pay more in state income tax and also sales tax as they're purchasing things in our communities. So the result is that it puts more money into the program than is actually even paid out. And that's when you consider that we might, some people might not be successful. It's also when we looked at an out-migration. Maybe we trained some people and they moved out of our state. We still show that uh, investments for low-income adults generates more tax revenue to the state than the program costs. For an associate's degree, with every dollar invested, there's a return of $3.70. That's to the state budget. That doesn't even talk about the broader benefits to the community, which actually is in the range of $5.37 for the community for every dollar invested. And for a bachelor's degree, it's $2.40 for every dollar. So I have a, we have a lot of data that shows the benefit of post-secondary education or higher learning opportunities for individuals. And I think I've hit my time. <laughs>